Hi everybody, this is Inam Dogan. I'm Insider Monkeys Research Director. Uh, today, Sayo Capital's Michael Caster is joining us. Uh, Sayo Capital is a long short uh, healthcare hedge fund that uh, was established in 2006 and managed to return nearly 11% versus 7.4% for the S&P 500 index. So it's one of the few hedge funds um, that have been uh, able to outperform the market by a decent margin with a near zero market exposure. Our subscribers know Michael, but uh, for those who don't know him, uh, Michael, why don't you tell us about your background? It started off in medicine. I was uh, an ENT resident at Columbia, so doing head and neck surgery and found that I was much more interested in the new technologies that were being brought to the, the field of medicine, interested in the business aspect as well. I opted to uh, explore that business aspect of it and found it was much more intellectually engaging than I I'd hoped it would be. And that was really my new career path. I, I started off as an investment banker at JP Morgan mm -hmm. and quickly realized that actually investing in companies and, and getting to know them at a deeper level was even more interesting and engaging. Pursued that path and that led me to uh, spend a couple of years at Sanford Bernstein, after which I founded SIO, mm -hmm. where I have been the portfolio manager now for 14 years. 14 years. So when, when did you switch from medicine to investing? Graduated from med school in 1997 Mm -hmm. and I left practicing medicine in 2000. All right, so you have been doing this for 20 years. 20 years. All right, and then you started Sayo Capital in 2006. Correct. Uh, you're based in New York? Yes, a team of six of us looking at all aspects of healthcare across the globe. So that certainly includes some of the early stage development companies, biotech and pharmaceutical companies. It encompasses medical device companies, and some of the more uh, structural companies that are oriented towards just delivering healthcare, hospitals, drugstores, HMOs, the entire gamut. Michael, uh, can you tell us about your investment process? How do you source your ideas? Uh, like, how do you decide which stocks to, to look into first? Part of the responsibility is to know as much as I possibly can. And it's amazing. If I look at 10 companies out of those, one of them, is going to end up being interesting as an investment opportunity. But that's at any given point in time. The other nine, I have an awareness of them. And so in following them over time, at some point, it's likely that each of those companies is likely to be interesting. I just don't know when. Then I watch new companies as they go public. I go to medical meetings and try to identify new therapies, new technologies, the companies that are taking advantage of those. Then we use a handful of, of different tools, screening tools that look across the landscape of every public company and identify things that may be interesting purely from a numbers basis. Okay, and then uh, you're a market neutral hedge fund. Can we say that or no? We're not market neutral by mandate, but we have tended to be market neutral in that there has been a lot that's been expensive and rich and hyped up and when we see those companies and we see aspects that look like they'll end up disappointing investors they lead us enthusiastic about finding short investments and i like philosophically the aspect of being able to generate returns and let people's money work for them and have great downside protection so that has been something that we've we've been able to achieve um, really robustly in almost every big downturn, take a lot of pride in that. So I actually hope that there will be a point to the extent that there's ever a big sell-off in the market that we will find a ton of bargains and be meaningfully long. If the world looks outrageously expensive or comfortable being net short, and we let that weighting of the, the portfolio, that posture be dictated by the quality of the investments we see. You don't, fi you don't find the market cheap right now? now we're actually at probably our max short position. I'm finding very little that's cheap and a large number of stocks that are outrageously expensive. Okay, so I've, I've been following Sayo Capital since 2013 and 
as far as I remember, you were never really that long, like at any point over the past seven, eight years. That That is definitely a correct observation. You know us well. And uh, in the last several years, it's been the wrong position. So in many times it's felt like fighting an uphill battle. But having said that, a lot of our short positions, they're idiosyncratic, they're individually based upon their own merits. And a lot of those short positions have worked and have done really well for us. So even during 2015, when, you know, before the election, Hillary Clinton was talking about, um, you know, restricting drug price increases, even during that period, you were you not short? Looking back over the past 10 years, really since the financial crisis, we've been net long by a few percent a couple of times, but for the most part, your memory is right. We've been uh, modestly net short for most of the past 10 years or so. Uh, okay, let's go back to today. Um, one of the best performing sectors in the market is healthcare. Is that correct? I uh, the only reason I pause is because being so focused on healthcare, I actually don't pay that much attention to the performance of the other sectors relative to it. So, right. don't know off the top of my head. I tend to think of us as just looking to generate consistent performance. I like to say that our job is to be consistently good, not occasionally great. And to me, that means generating consistent performance regardless of the market conditions and being able to generate uh, positive returns even in down markets, especially in down markets. I, I remember reading your January investor letter and you were talking about the coronavirus, um, not pandemic at that time, but I was reading that you were saying it's inevitable that it's going to be spreading all over the world. How did you play it? In, in February with the expectation that coronavirus is going to, you know, hit the uh, U.S. markets. Even with that expectation, our investments really were not substantially changed. We had entered 2020 with a net short posture based on that fundamental view of finding more shorts than longs. And so with uh, an anticipation that this this virus was likely not to be contained within China. The posture we had going into the year was a very comfortable one. The, the most notable aspects are that there is a long incubation period where people can be asymptomatic and transmit the virus. And as far as viruses go, this is fairly transmissible. It's easily contagious. So it's implausible that the virus will, will be eliminated and as we allow more social interactions, we are gonna have uh, additional waves. Now, some of the data that's come out is actually fascinating. There was a, a sample of people uh, tested for having been exposed to the virus in various regions in New York. And that, that study indicated that in New York City, it was around 20% of people in the sample that had been tested that have been exposed outside of New York City. In, in upstate New York, the lowest region, the, the rate of uh, past infections was around 3.9%. So it, that shows me two things. One, a lot of people that have been exposed, still a lot more to go. But with that number of people who have been exposed, the possibility of having wiped the virus out from stopping uh, interpersonal uh, communication and, and interaction, there's just no chance of that. So seems inevitable that, that when uh, social distancing protocols get lifted, that people will begin to interact and we will see additional waves. The one other interesting aspect to me, a big part of the reason for implementing social distancing in the first place was the idea that to the extent that this is such a transmissible virus, if it were to spread through the entire population all at once, you're going to have your, your percentage of the population looks like it's around 1% that could fall gravely ill and need medical care. If that 1% all ends up being afflicted at that same point in time, it ends up overwhelming the healthcare system and preventing or, or precluding the ability of the system to deliver that care for those who need it. So the, the theory, the idea has been for those people who are really sick, 
if we can slow this 1% from, from getting sick and spread it out over a long period of time, care can be delivered to them. In practice, what's happened is those people who fall very ill, there's been a very high mortality rate. So there's a, a group that has been vocal about allowing the virus to spread throughout society because whether that 1% gets sick all at once or whether it is indeed spread out, even if that 1% who falls really ill is unable to seek medical care, it doesn't seem like it's actually making a big difference on impacting survival. It's not that it's making no difference, but the survival rates are in the uh, 20 to, to 30% range across the aggregate of numbers that I've seen is, is the best number. So the majority of people, 70 to 80% of people who are getting care, the care is unfortunately futile. So as these additional waves of virus end up spreading through society, there's been a, a paradigm that is now in, in our collective mindsets, but it's possible that the, the collective public and medical decision, uh, or discussion rather, could change the decision making and could allow for uh, a willingness to have um, uh, higher rates of, of infectiousness. I guess that remains to be seen. Here's what I'm thinking about this uh, pandemic. It seems like the virus doesn't affect people under the age of 40 that much. Like the, the infection fatality rate is 0.1% uh, or even lower. If you go like people, you know, who are uh, below the age of 30. Um, so wouldn't it be a better strategy to uh, allow these people those are under the age of 40 to go out and, you know, it's it's not mandatory, obviously, it's optional. If they want to go out, they should be allowed to go out and then con contract the virus and build immunity or potential immunity or resistance to the virus. That most of those people end up having some interaction with a family member who is in the demographic that has higher mortality. So that, that population, if you allow them to, uh, to generally go out and interact and conduct their daily lives as they go home and interact with other family members, that's the interaction that ends up um, making whatever social distancing protocols you, you'd put in place for the, uh, the more fragile or elderly population, making it ineffective. But I mean, 21% of New York City is already infected, right? And if we can, you know, carve out maybe another 15, 20, percent of people who who would be you know uh, who would be getting infected again um, we can reach 40 percent and that, that'll reduce the threat of the virus in the fall don't you think so you get a couple of things there it's actually not clear whether having been infected with the virus confers protection i guess based on what i know about other viruses that it probably does if not prevent a risk of second infection, it probably mitigates the severity, but there are other coronaviruses, cold viruses, where you can get exposed multiple times, have the same impact of illness. So it's it's really not clear whether once you've been exposed one time, if you will have protection. Then the, the other aspect is, this 20% of people that got infected, hospital systems here in New York City were overwhelmed. The entire hospital systems across most hospitals were turned into ICU beds where people who developed severe respiratory distress could be placed on a ventilator and hopefully get the oxygen they need so their lungs could heal, they could get off the ventilator. And most people weren't getting off the ventilator, but that, that degree of infectiousness for just 20% meant that there was a, a month long period where the entire staff, every room, every physician, every piece of equipment, was dedicated and repurposed to treating COVID. So the, the scary scenario where the authorities and the medical community are trying to balance it is to prevent that 20% from having people go and, and interact freely and making that a 40% uh, rate of infectiousness in one concentrated period and overwhelming the system even further. And even if the, the, the potential for medical care is unlikely to help, there's the prospect of saying, well, 20% of people who could get treated might ultimately 
get off the ventilator if they need ventilation support and return to normal life. And so if you were to overwhelm the system so much that people can't even be admitted because there aren't beds and there aren't physicians to treat them, that cre uh, creates the potential for um, social upheaval as well as the, the challenges in dealing with that from a healthcare perspective. So what is the optimal strategy in, in your opinion? Our job isn't to predict what should be, it's to recognize what is likely to happen and make decisions based on that. As there are additional waves of infections and as individual regions start having their hospital beds fill up, because even 1% of the population that gets severely affected, if you have 1% uh, of a 10% group, that'll overwhelm the hospital system. I think that we'll see pockets flare up and we'll see rolling uh, social distancing protocols get implemented across the country. So there'll be gradual return to work to a, a limited degree and then that amount of, of social interaction that is permitted by the local governments will wax and wane as infection rates end up um, spiking and, and receding. That's my best guess now. Uh, so what do you think about the potential treatment uh, options for COVID-19, like investors are really excited about Gilead's uh, Remdesivir. Thing that I've looked at from a therapeutic standpoint has left me feeling underwhelmed and thinking that uh, Remdesivir and hydroxychloroquine are unlikely to be meaningful therapies. The, the best chance that we have of intervening is developing a vaccine. Most vaccines take about uh, five or six years to develop. So the prospect of developing a vaccine in the timelines that I'm, I'm hearing discussed with the, the potential for a vaccine to be on the market in late 2021, which is still 18 months away, would be unprecedented speed. So there are not really effective treatments. Vaccines are at least 18 months away and the virus will keep spreading wave after wave. Is that your base case scenario? But also with the recognition that as nasty as this virus is, and I say nasty in the context of the people who get a COVID flu, it's a bad flu. And there are some young people who uh, succumb to the virus and, and end up dying. I hear anecdotes from my friends who are on the front lines treating patients still. Uh, it can be heart-wrenching and it is worse than the flu, but the vast majority of people, we're, we're talking about uh, probably a 1% rate that will be severely affected. Now, you also alluded to that 1% is not evenly spread over the entire population. So people over 65, people with diabetes, hypertension, obesity, uh, other comorbidities, that population is likely to see a, a mortality rate with the, the greater the age and the greater the number of comorbidities, that can reach a 10% mortality. Mm -hmm. But across the entire population, the way you described it, I think right now, that's, that's the picture we're looking at. So let's talk about some individual stocks. Um, I'm going to tell I'm, I'm going to give you the ticker symbols and then you share what you think about those stocks. And I picked most of these stocks from your uh, latest 13F portfolio. So um, probably you still have positions in these stocks. So the first stock is G-I-L-D, Gilead. For the large cap pharma companies, I spend a lot of time looking at these relative to each other. They're one of the, the aspects that I have seen over my years of investing is that it's not my responsibility to assert where valuation should be, but rather to take a look at the market I'm influenced by valuations. So to the extent that prevailing valuations are generally cheap, I'm more inclined to be thinking that I'll have a, a longer bias when they're generally expensive, then it's harder to be enthusiastic about finding long investments. But within groups of companies, I'll look at where they're trading collectively and the more profitable they are, the, the less earnings dispersion, especially in near-term periods, the easier it is for me to to use valuation as a framework. Mm -hmm. Gilead is one that we invested when the stock was uh, 
below 70, where at that point in time, with a, a relatively anemic pipeline, uh, Gilead was, was trading with the evaluation that they were going to earn their market cap. There, if you were to, to buy a share of Gilead for $66, $70, it was likely to earn that value back over a period of about eight years. And Gilead has its own inherent issues, especially in that the predominant value that the, the company offers the, the shareholders, the owners, comes from their HIV franchise that is facing generics uh, in waves um, over the next two years and then again in the uh, 2027 period. So far enough out that the, the company has time to monetize it, but it's on the visible horizon. So right now, Gilead has moved up, especially with anticipation, as you pointed out, of remdesivir having potential. I don't see the potential there mm -hmm. based on the science that I've seen. And so we've actually exited our Gilead position. And if anything, um, uh, above 80, it's, it's looking more like a short candidate than a, a long one now. All right, actually, how about Moderna? That's, that's another, you know, the stay at home stock right now performing very well. Yeah. But I see it as a sh more like a short candidate than a long candidate because the price already reflects um, a lot of positive news. Derna has a market cap now of almost 20 billion. It's around 18.5 billion, I think. And a lot of the hope for Moderna, a lot of the, the run up in valuation, came after the company discussed having their own product where they're developing it as a potential vaccine for coronavirus. And with vaccines, there are three general types of vaccines. The first is taking a virus, killing or inactivating it, and taking that whole virus, injecting it, and trying to elicit immune response. That, without a doubt, provides the, the strongest and most robust and, and greatest likelihood of, of producing um, a strong immune response, doing what a vaccine needs to do. The second is taking pieces of the virus that are exposed when they're in the body and just injecting those pieces, often with something called an adjuvant, something that is a, a booster that tells the immune system, hey, check out what's going on here. Problems are, are floating around, so look at the specific surface markers and you wanna pay attention. And then the third approach is what Moderna is doing. They're just taking pieces of RNA, and RNA is basically a recipe. It's a map of how to make a protein. So they're injecting the recipe to make these surface proteins that are just like injecting the surface proteins themselves. Now the, the data we have to date is that that approach is less immunogenic, stimulates less of an immune response than the other two approaches, and there are no vaccines that are yet approved or that have yet proven to be effective based on the approach that Moderna is taking. It's interesting, and one of the advantages is, whereas making proteins can often be time consuming, making RNA is very easy and very simple, so they could scale up production, but there are around 70 different vaccine programs. Many of the vaccine programs using the, uh, the other two approaches that are known to stimulate the immune system well. So given the number of vaccines that are in development, the immunogenicity of the, of the various programs, it's not without promise, but there's a lot of value currently being ascribed to that program right now. So can I ask, are you short Moderna or not? Very small short position, and it's small just because I have seen over time that things that generate excitement can have prices that go to absolutely mm -hmm. astounding uh, levels. I, I think of um, the, the marijuana stocks that are, are down 90% from their peaks two years ago, just as a somewhat recent example. Let's move on to insurance stocks, UNH versus Anthem. The insurance stocks have traded in a very tight group recently. And there's been much more sentiment driving the price swings than there has been any 
uh, fundamental driver of what's going on with these companies. In terms of the individual stocks, I look across the landscape. I have a, a slight preference for Anthem over United, uh, recognizing that United has the advantage of having a diversified sort of base of income with not only providing insurance, but their healthcare IT business, their analytics and consulting business that uh, is contained within Optum is a very big profit driver and is uh, diversifying. With that being somewhat valuation sensitive and seeing that Anthem is modestly more attractive of a, a slight preference for Anthem, though both those stocks are currently among our holders, as is one other, which is Molina, and that's a, an HMO that services the Medicaid population. So especially in an environment where unemployment is rising and there's a risk that individuals who lose their jobs might not go back to work and might end up uh, over time falling below the poverty and uh, the poverty line and, and seeking insurance from uh, state-based Medicaid, Molina is poised to really benefit from those. As I look across the HMOs, that uh, that narrative of potential assault from the, the leftmost political uh, wings of government is perennially going to be present. And as there are more powerful uh, individuals that, that represent um, liberal-leaning Democrats, they very likely are going to discuss ways to dismantle the current method of, of delivering health care. And I, I remember a, a couple of, of times where I heard Obama speak and opine, and I, I agreed with this pretty strongly, says, if I had been able to go back in time and, and really construct a, a system of providing insurance, it's quite possible that we, the U.S., could have had a system of government-sponsored health care, not dissimilar to Canada or Sweden or, or the U.S., but the system that we have in place now is one that works for us. People like their health care, and the prospect of changing something that is so fundamental to one of the components of uh, of our lives, only when we need it, but when we need it and everybody interacts with it at some point, this is so fundamental that changing the delivery of health care doesn't seem like a realistic prospect, especially in an environment where there's so much political gridlock and animosity between the prevailing parties. So uh, I tend to recognize that there will be periods in time when, when HMOs traded a discount, when the discount is great enough, they deserve a place in our holdings. So my next question is also related with the insurance companies, hospitals, HCA. So the COVID-19 pandemic is actually a good news for insurance companies because they don't have to pay for the elective surgeries, which are the most profitable operations for hospitals. Uh, so hospital stocks went down 50%. Yet insurance companies also went down. So what, what's going on here? Insurance companies, the fear is that as unemployment rises, you'll have people uh, dropping off the ranks of the uninsured. For hospitals, very much as you say, COVID is a disaster for hospitals. Hospitals are losing massive amounts of money because not only are the, the profit centers, elective surgeries, cardiology, orthopedics, but the, the additional costs for, uh, for PPE, for personal protective equipment, for uh, isolation protocols, for having uh, rooms with negative pressure so that even if somebody coughs, the, the air is sucked in and uh, pushed out through a HEPA filter. The, the costs are enormous. The revenues are being decimated. And the, the near term for hospitals is it's bleak. Having said that, in a lot of communities, hospitals are the single biggest employers. And it's just implausible to have a scenario where hospitals could be allowed to go bankrupt and cease to function. And we're seeing that with the CARES Act that allocated, I think it was $300, million, uh, $300 billion for hospitals in the, the first version and another $75 billion or so going from memory. So as hospitals continue to lose money, 
the government will step in and make sure they have the ability to function, especially now that they're functioning and being the, the front lines for taking care of these, these people who are on death's door. HCA by far is the best run of any hospital chain that I've come across. Management is thoughtful, they're careful, they're, uh, they're financially prudent, and to the extent that other hospitals are likely to, to suffer, they won't they, uh, avoid a, a drop in profit, but that'll be transient. Mm -hmm. And if anything, I see them likely as being able to pick up additional assets on the cheap, step in and take advantage of any restructuring opportunities that are there. And over the long term, that, that long term is maybe a year, uh, I see them coming out of this doing quite well and perhaps even being a beneficiary. So hospitals are getting $175 billion. Were you able to model how that amount of you know money will be distributed among hospitals or the details aren't public yet? Uh, the details are public. I'm going from, uh, I gotta check my notes actually, but so we can see the, the amounts that various hospitals will get. We can do back of the envelope calculations based on what hospitals submit to their, their billing of, of Medicare. The question still remains, um, are hospitals going to go from having 10% EBITDA margins, or in the case of, of HCA, they're, they're closer to 14 and a half. Are the margins going to be zero? Are they going to be minus 10? Are they going to be minus 20? The, the, the potential for losses is really substantial. And so if you think of these companies on a DCF basis, which makes more sense than a, a PE because there's so much leverage across hospitals. Um, the, the current year, the expectation really should be that earnings will be zero. Now for HCA, they earn roughly, call it $10 a share. And so to the extent that your value was $150, probably the most appropriate thing is to subtract 10 and maybe half of that will be offset by grants that the hospitals are going to get from um, the CARES Act. Um, okay, our next ticker is GSK. GSK in many ways is a lot like Gilead. One of the large cap companies where looking at valuations is, is important and waiting till sentiment gets to extreme and valuations get pushed to extreme. GSK is interesting. Like Gilead, they have an incredibly thin disappointing pipeline, disappointing especially in the context of how much is spent in R&D every year. And these large cap companies, even companies of, of well in excess of $100 billion, can have single profits, uh, single drugs that drive the profitability across the entire company. For Glaxo, it's Shingrix. It's a, a vaccine for herpes zoster. And if you know anybody who has ever had herpes zoster, it's basically a reactivation of the chickenpox. Once we get chickenpox, it never really goes away. It actually lives in nerves near the spinal cord. And as people get older and their immune system, for whatever reason, uh, has periods where uh, the immune system strength wanes, chickenpox can travel down those nerves and form painful blisters on the skin. It can be debilitatingly painful. So a vaccine that cuts the rate of having zoster outbreaks as Shingrix does by that 90% should be used in everybody over the age of 50. It absolutely should be standard of care around the world. Now, up until now, Glaxo has been supply constrained. And they talk about having a, a big bolus of supply relief or, or additional manufacturing capacity coming online around 2022. So Shingrix is clearly the most important driver for Glaxo. Earlier in the year, or in the, the last couple of months of, of last year, several concerns end up pushing the share price down. The first was that their HIV franchise was going to face more competition from Gilead's Bictarvi. The second was that their inhaler franchise was going to see further price pressure as we saw more launches of generics of Advair, their inhaler franchise. And those aspects outweighed my, my viewpoint for Shingrix and, and pushed the valuation down below reasonable levels. We stepped in. Glaxo has bounced back quite a bit. It remains a little bit attractive versus other pharma companies, but largely 
in line and if you don't have a position now is probably not the right time what do you think about Merck MRK Merck like Glaxo has a single drug that is driving the entire performance of the the company and that's their drug Keytruda so Keytruda very interestingly was acquired when Merck acquired Shearing Plow and it, Shearing Plow actually got the drug from the acquisition of Organon small company many years before that so this single drug probably has the potential to grow to be a 20 billion dollar drug has uh, revolutionized the treatment of cancer and has basically been a, a cornerstone of the idea of immunotherapy getting the immune system to be revved up to recognize cancer as looking distorted and foreign and, and having the immune system fight cancer it's a mainstay of therapy for lung cancer uh, kidney cancer skin cancer uh, among others the challenge that Merck's going to face is that with so much profit driven by this single drug Keytruda uh, when this goes generic and it's quite a ways in the future it's 2031 but at this point in time to the extent that we have any visibility into the pipeline of companies which they all tend to provide us there is not a lot that looks like it's going to have the, the potential to replace it so Merck like other companies the the valuation of large cap pharma companies for the most part has converged uh, quite a bit over the last month and a half. Merck uh, falls in that, that category of being slightly attractive, but at this point, pretty close to fair value. Okay, so our next ticker is MBT, another large cap. The large cap med device companies, in a very similar vein as large cap pharma companies where I compare across them, looking at the, the valuation and trying to identify any dynamics and stories for those companies. Medtronic is one that had uh, sold off to a, a much greater degree than its peers and had become attractive and does show up among our holdings. We've trimmed Medtronic as it's bounced back to a large degree. And currently, now that uh, it has bounced back, I would point out that one of its key profit drivers, the TAVR or transcatheter aortic valve replacement that Medtronic has called uh, core valve is about to face some some pressure from a newly approved and, and recently launched similar product from Boston Scientific called Lotus. And in thinking and recognizing how narratives take hold of companies, how individual profit lines end up being particularly uh, uh, prominent among the minds of investors, Core Valve has been one that's been a big profit driver if it shows a, a deceleration, as I think it will, even though valuations are modestly attractive, that could overshadow it and actually lead Medtronic to sell off at this point. Okay, so can we say that you track all these large cap stocks and then whenever there's an opportunity comes along, like if the stock price declines 20% and if that's an overreaction, you step in and buy it for Okay, so let's let's uh, talk about Pfizer. So th this was another stock in your portfolio at the end of December. So what do you think about Pfizer? Um, currently, Pfizer, uh, it, it's among the more diversified of the large cap pharma names with a couple of different products end up driving the, the enthusiasm. For, so for Pfizer, there, there are three products that are really prominent are Vindicel, a new product that's just being launched for heart failure. Uh, it is their uh, breast cancer drug, palbocyclib, and it's their vaccine for uh, strep pneumo. So across those, the, the biggest potential for Pfizer is that palbocyclib, or Ibrantz, as the brand name is, will show that using it earlier in therapy, and the earlier that cancer drugs are used, the longer they're used because as cancer becomes more and more advanced, new therapies have only a short period of time before the cancer learns how to beat it. So earlier use of therapy is likely to show uh, that it's effective at controlling disease. Because of the delays of COVID, we're seeing a lot of trials get pushed back. And I had expected some data this year, it's possible that it gets pushed back till next year, 
There are two trials underway, the, the Palace trial and the Penelope B trial. And I think those are likely to, to be successful. Having said that, Pfizer had traded down to under $30 and has since bounced back around 20%. That threshold that you identified is the, the type of move that's meaningful. And at this point, my assessment is that the current share price is now reflecting a lot of my expectations. And I see Pfizer more in the fair, uh, the fair value category than the attractive category where it was back in December. I remember like 20 years ago, my professor telling me that Pfizer is on the cusp of, you know, or we are on the cusp of some uh, breakthroughs in medicine. So it's time to buy Pfizer. And 20 years ago, Pfizer was $36. And 20 years later, today, it's still around $36. Um, I feel like it's like a utility stock that should be trading at 20 times earnings rather than 14, 15 times earnings right now because you know it, it has a dividend yield of more than 4%, right? There are two aspects to looking at the drug companies. The first, I'm reminded of a quote by Napoleon. History is a set of lies agreed upon. And that is very much what pharmaceutical company earnings feels like. And when I say a set of lies agreed upon, uh, most companies commonly instruct investors to exclude a set of charges and look at, at the company and say, the underlying dynamics of the company are just more easily understood, excluding certain charges. Sometimes that makes sense. Maybe there's been a, a an earthquake in an area you would never expect an earthquake and a plant needs to be rebuilt. And the cost of rebuilding that plant is is something that I can say, you know, I'm going to exclude that. doesn't make sense to keep it up. For pharma companies at large, they spend significant money every year doing restructuring and buying products where they expense the, the new products they're buying as in-process R&D. But that is a, a, a real ongoing form of R&D. So when I look at the underlying earnings, including these charges that exist every single year, their true earnings are about 20 to 30% lower than what's reported. So your assertion that it should be trading at, at 20 times, it actually is trading at about 20 times their real underlying earnings. All right, that's a good point. So next stock that we are gonna ask about is REGN, Regenera. Is a, a great company at uh, developing drugs. They've had uh, partnerships with Sanofi over the years after Sanofi many years ago had made a, an investment in uh, the company. They've got two drugs currently that are driving the growth and profitability. The first drug is a drug for an eye condition called AMD or age-related macular degeneration. Essentially, it's a, a cause of progressive blindness in the elderly and competes with Lucentis. The drug is injected into the eye every eight weeks or so and as awful as that sounds, as people get accustomed to it, it's actually fairly innocuous. It's more innocuous if you're the physician than the patient, but it's a whole lot better than blindness. The second drug, which is taken over as the, the main driver of profitability, is the drug Dupixent or Dupilumab, which now has three indications, atopic dermatitis, asthma, and nasal polyps. It is a fantastic drug. It's efficacious, it's safe, and uh, it, it's easy to use. Uh, it's a, an injection that's given by patients themselves, much like insulin, once a week. So these two products are still growing, and there's a, a pipeline as well. The, the company had traded at more modest levels back when we owned it, when the, the stock price was under 400 and those more modest levels were because there was a new product that was being developed and launched by Novartis called BioView that was a threat to ILEA, one of the two big profit drivers. Well, it turns out that having launched BioView, Novartis has seen there is a rare complication that is um, associated with the toxicity in the eye, and that has shut down the enthusiasm on the part of ophthalmologists to use this competitive product. So with that, um, Regeneron appreciated a lot. 
it's now approached our sense of, of fair value. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have since recently exited the position. I'm happy to take advantage of um, that 20% that move that you characterize for large cap companies. So um, let's talk about some European stocks. Uh, first, let, let me ask about Sanofi, SNY. What do you think about that? Right now is one of the cheaper of the pharma companies that, that is all converging upon a, a relatively tight point. So there are two aspects to Sanofi. One, like Regeneron, they're really benefiting from the growth of Dupilumab, Dupixit. The second is that Sanofi has articulated a plan of cost cutting and operating margin expansion that is not yet in sell side analyst numbers. And the pharma companies, they as, as high as their operating margins are, which are in the, the mid 30s often, they still spend tremendous amounts on both R&D and marketing, and they have the luxury of being able to restructure and cut costs and improve operating margins to even greater degrees. Regeneron has told us that's their plan. And so their product portfolio outside of Dupilumab may look uninspiring, but it's stable. And if it's stable with a, a plan, a management team that is intent on cutting costs and boosting, uh, boosting profitability and showing EPS upside, that can make for an attractive investment, and um, that's where it stands for us. What is your favorite European healthcare stock right now? It's UCB. It's a Belgian specialty pharma company that has two franchises. One is uh, treating epilepsy. The other is treating autoimmune conditions. The company has two really promising drugs to treat autoimmune conditions. The first one is a completely novel mechanism of action. It's uh, a drug to drop antibody levels in people who have excess antibodies that might be causing autoimmunity. The, the mechanism of action is called uh, blockade of FCRN. And essentially, the, the drug has been neglected by analysts broadly because it has a, a side effect of causing headache. Now, as I've looked at this, the promise of this is to replace a therapy known as IVIG, where uh, a person would receive an IV infusion of exogenous antibodies. And those exogenous antibodies actually have the paradoxical effect of lowering some antibodies that could be toxic floating around in a, a person's own uh, plasma. IVIG causes massive headaches. In some people, it causes debilitating headache. And looking at the underlying mechanism, it's my suspicion that UCB's drug has a very similar profile than some of the other drugs that have not reported headache to the same degree. I think once they're all on the market, they all have a, a likelihood of, of being um, commercially promising, pending successful trials, which at this point, I think there's a, a lot of promise. The second is a drug that will uh, compete with two other therapies. One is TALTS by Eli Lilly. The other is Cosentex, sold by Novartis. And these are drugs that have revenues of, of two to three billion dollars each. They both block a molecule called IL-17. It's an inflammatory hormone that floats around in the body. There are different isoforms, different uh, flavors, I guess, of IL-17. Both TALTS and Cosentex block only the A form, the drug that UCB is developing blocks forms A and F and also has a, uh, the, the potential to be dosed at longer intervals. And for those reasons, I think that this has the potential to, to have in excess of a billion dollars actually doing head-to-head -head studies versus Cosentix. If they show superiority, this could be a, a $3 billion drug. And if that's the case, UCB is probably likely to double from here. Amazing. Um, I didn't see Johnson & Johnson in your portfolio. Extremely well-run company with a valuation that is very much in line with peers. I look for uh, some kind of dislocation or investor disappointment that leads the stock to drop. And if it does, 
And if it drops enough and there's a valuation disparity, I would be very happy to own it. We have owned it in the past, don't currently own it. Uh, how about Novartis? Similar picture. Novartis has a valuation that is similar to most of its peers, but has probably, this is in my opinion, the best pipeline across the entire pharmaceutical gamut, with the exception possibly of, of Roche, its neighbor in Switzerland. So Novartis, uh, with that narrative of having a, a promising pipeline, has um, and it, it merits having a, a modest position, I think. So we know that you're net short right now in the market, but what is your favorite large cap stock that we talked about so far? UCB. So, Michael, let me ask you about your summer plans. What are you planning to do this summer? At this point, <laughs> with all the restrictions in place, looks like my summer plans are confined to spending time at home. So I'll get to catch up on my reading. I'm looking forward to being able to, to re-engage in activity, if nothing else, to go to the gym and, and play squash, which I really enjoy. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Don't forget to subscribe to Insider Monkey. We level the playing field for small investors.